everybody. It's time to say happy birthday to us here on the McGraw Family's Young Artist Showcase. As you've gathered from the applause, our theme music was not pre-recorded, but played here in the green space in its WQXR by debut by the Gaudete Brass Quintet. The music, which I think was written to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the showcase way back when, is by Eric Iwazin, one of three distinguished composers joining our birthday party. So Eric, come on up for a moment. So I don't know if you remember, but when we asked you to do this piece, what goes through your head? What are you, what are you looking for? What, how do you start? Well, you had asked me, uh, first of all, I was delighted uh, to be able to write for you and, and, and you know, your wonderful program. And, uh, um, and I wanted something festive. And you said this was, uh, you wanted a piece that was going to be opening the program and for Brass Quintet. And so I thought, oh, okay, I'd write something with a lot of energy to it, uh, with some big space, you know, so that uh, it just it has a sense of nice resonance and uh, uh, hopefully an exciting sound in the way they play it. Oh, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Eric. Eric, and you can now sit down again and enjoy the whole fanfare, Sounds because <laughs> we just used the first 30 seconds of it or so, and they added a little ending that you were, may have surprised a bit about. Yeah, <laughs> it, it sounded very good. But anyway, uh, we're now going to hear the entire fanfare. Thank you. Thank you. 
Eric Iwazin's Showcase Fanfare. Complete this time, played by the Gaudete Brass Quintet, otherwise known as trumpeters Charles Russell Roberts and Bill Backstresser, hornist Philip Cassell, trombonist Paul Von Hoff, and tubist Scott Teggy. Eric, please stand one more time so we can thank you for your <laughs> superb contribution. There's another very special date I'd like to observe. 2018 marks the 100th birth anniversary of Harold W. McGraw, Jr., who was the visionary CEO of McGraw-Hill, conceived the showcase, and was our guest on program number one 40 years ago tomorrow. Now, of course, the series is flourishing through the generous underwriting of the Family Foundation, named in Harold's memory, and administered by his son, Terry. Unfortunately, Terry is stuck at a board meeting out on the West Coast, but uh, we will have a recorded message from him in a little while. And now let's proceed to the first of two more big deal anniversary celebrations, not counting our own 40th, that is, uh, because in 2018, John Corleano, who actually worked here at WQX Arb before giving up a promising career as a clerk typist to become a multiple prize winning composer, he will turn 80. Lovely age, I remember it well. John, please join me here on stage, if you will. So what do you remember about early days at QXR? Oh, they were wonderful. Uh, we got in late, all of us, and Marty Bookspan, uh, who was the um, music director, I believe. I guess he was director of recorded music was the fancy director title. recorded music. Yeah. He never seemed to mind, and then we'd go upstairs uh, to the cafeteria and have breakfast, <laughs> and then we came down and uh, started our work. And I got to do some programming, too, uh, and uh, really enjoyed my years at QXR. You know, programming music in an hour show, for example, is very much like composing a piece in that you have to have balances. You have to have a piece of one kind that sets up a need for a piece of another kind, just like you have to have music of one kind that sets up a need for music of another kind. So I got good training at QXR to be a composer. Now. One of the reasons that set up this, this whole event here is that there was a recording for Brass Quintet by the Gazebo Brass of the overture to your Gazebo dances. Right. And I liked it, and apparently you liked it, and so I asked Cliff Colnott, who had transcribed the, the uh, overture, to do the rest of the suite. Do you mind it when other people mess around with music that takes it in a different direction than you envisioned? Um, I don't mind it. It's a very hard piece for the brass quintet, I will say that. Um, it was never meant for a brass quintet. It was originally piano four hands. They were four pieces that I wrote for various friends who play the piano, but not professionally. The first movement was dedicated to my mother, who played four hand music and two piano music when she was uh, in Brooklyn with me, and other people were dedicated uh, for the same reasons, that they loved music and played it at home. And then I orchestrated it, wrote it for band, but I never matched it for brass quartet, quintet. Yeah. Well, let's hear what it sounds like. John, thank you so much. Can I and just say one thing? It's, it's, yes. in, it's in four movements. It starts out <clears throat> with a, a very bright overture. Then it has a strange waltz that seems to be missing a beat every once in a while. <laughs> then it has an adagio that builds to a big climax, and finally a tarantella movement, which I've then used in my first symphony, by the way. Uh, oh, so you rated it already. I rated it later, much later, <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, thank you, John Curliano, and onward. <laughs> For the first time, we are going to hear the complete gazebo dances played by the Gaudete Quintet. Thank you. 
Carliano's Gazebo Dances, transcribed by Clifford Caldot and premiered tonight by the Gaudete Brass Quintet. And now, John, time for you to stand one more time and <laughs> accept our congratulations. <laughs> it's been an extraordinary life of musical creativity. Now, we have one more octogenarian to me tonight. But before we get there, I'd like to find out a bit about the Garote Brass Quintet. So which of you guys wants to reveal all? Oh, Scott, do you oh, keep to be here? Yeah, come on over. Excellent. Well, so we as a group started 13 years ago uh, as when we were all students in college. And uh, Paul and I are still original members. And we just wanted somewhere to create opportunities for ourselves to make a career in music. And so we started doing this. And initially when we started, we wanted to play just sort of, actually we would do anything for gigs or for money. <laughs> you know. And as we went all around through our sort of career doing this, we saw a really need to promote new music for Brass Quintet. And so we're so excited tonight to have uh, the new arrangement of uh, John's piece, to have a new piece by from William Bolcom and uh, Eric's piece, all these great people writing for music. And so we have a couple albums out uh, now, actually a tribute to John uh, on his 75th birthday five years ago we commissioned five of his former students in his honor to write pieces for him and so we played a concert of those in Chicago and had John come to Chicago along with some other organizations and, and had this sort of celebratory week for him and so we're so excited to be here today you know for your upcoming 80th birthday <laughs> and so thank you for everything you've done for music so wow, indeed, indeed. <laughs> and now Charles Roberts, we, uh, well, at least I had a hard time with Latin, so you have to tell us what Gaudete means and why you chose it. Uh, Gaudete is the Latin word for joy, and Paul, please correct me if I'm wrong, um, and it's too... <laughs> Um, I, these gentlemen came up with the name when they joined, when they uh, started the group. Um, however, it's really just to explain the joy that this music can really bring to people. Um, it's joyful and it's exuberant, and um, th it really just fits what we try to bring to it. It's one thing to bring joy to the audiences. How about to you? It sounds like you have a lot of hard work to do to put these together. It's a lot of hard work, but I think for all of us, there's nothing we'd rather be doing um, to bring new music to the world, and it's such an important idiom. Um, this ensemble is not very old. Um, it really has been around since the 1950s. Well, this is a young artist showcase, so, <laughs> you know, I, I gotta catch you while we it's, can. It's a very young ensemble, and uh, but there's so many incredible composers, uh, living composers, who are still writing for this uh, ensemble, and it takes groups like us to really advocate for it. Have you played some of Eric Uwaysen's pieces, too? Uh, we have. Um, just a few minutes ago, we played a piece. Um, well, yeah, that, uh, <laughs> that one I know about. Yeah, um, yeah he, he's written a, a breadth of music for, for brass and uh, a lot for the brass quintet. Um, there are a few other fanfares that we actually perform on a very regular basis. And um, I know in school I performed a, a trumpet and piano sonata and another piece that he wrote for piano, trumpet, and uh, violin. And Shadowcatcher, we played a concerto for band and brass quintet recently, so um, he's been an incredible champion for this ensemble. Now, Scott, the uh, Garate is going to play another work, and I think by one of John's students, is that right? Exactly, so this next piece on the program came from that project five years ago by a uh, gentleman named Jonathan Newman. He studied with John at the Juilliard School, and he wrote us this piece, Prayers of Steel, based on uh, poetry by uh, Carl Sandburg. And it was a tribute to sort of Chicago and his Chicago poems. And the first movement, Limited, is a really strong, sort of forceful movement. Uh, you're gonna really feel the power of the brass. The second movement's called Foxtrot. Imagine like, you know, the 1930s, 
30s in Chicago, like walking through the streets in a jazz club, you know, would be playing music. You could hear it on the streets. And then all of a sudden, the door would fly open. You would get a burst of sound uh, from that jazz, and then it would close again. It's that sort of flavor of a piece. It's really exciting. And then the third movement is this really gorgeous uh, gospel uh, tune, almost. He wrote, actually, the text underneath all of our notes. So I imagine John will be having turning it into a choir piece at some point. But it really exploits the singing part of our instruments that we have. And I th we think it's a really great addition to the repertoire. And we feel excited to be able to share it with you guys tonight. Wonderful. So if you will, return to your performing spots. And we will hear as, uh, one, two, or three movements, depending on how much time we have here, for Jonathan Newman's Prayers of Steel. Thank you. 
And there's another first hearing on the Young Artist Showcase, if not WQXR altogether. Excerpts from Jonathan Newman's Prayers of Steel, suggested by the poetry of Carl Sandburg and dedicated to their home city of Chicago. This is the Gaudete Brass Quintet. First visit to the green space, a great thanks to Charles Russell Roberts, Bill Baxter, Philip Castle, Paul Von Hoff, and Scott Teggy. Now, don't go too far away, guys, because we're gonna need you for our grand finale. But we'll let you rest for just a little bit because we are gearing up for our next world premiere. And that involves another world-renowned composer, William Bolcom, who, whether he likes it or not, will also be turning 80 in a few months. With him is Mezzo Joan Morris. And those of you who remember my old listening room show will know that Joni and Bill gave us all sorts of delicious hours back then. So Joan and Bill, welcome to our grand and multiple WQXR birthday party. start till the lights come up, right? <laughs> so this is yours. Jody, how long have you and Bill been hanging out together? Uh, we met on March 6th, 1972. Wow, uh, you remember the date and time, everything? Yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> um, we were introduced by a girlfriend. Um, uh, we had been on a non-union uh, theater tour together, and um, when we got back to New York, um, she uh, married this artist, and she became an amateur matchmaker. And uh, <laughs> she told me, um, she and Steve used to go to parties, she said, so I met this guy. Um, you might like him. He used to be a classical musician, but he's given all that up. He's playing ragtime. <laughs> so I, I thought, well, I'll meet him. You know, I was dating other guys. And uh, uh, anyway, we, we just kind of hit it off. I always say that night we kind of started a conversation. We haven't finished it yet. Uh, <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Bill, what do you remember of those early days? I was sitting in my apartment on Christopher Street and a friend of mine and I were going to go out and have Chinese food. And we had just put a buzzer downstairs in the, in the building. It had not been, it had been open all the time. My uh, fifth floor walk-up had been knocked over six times, but thankfully I was never there. And, you know, I had a wonderful deal with the uh, uh, fellow down the road who was the insurance person. And I'd just take my sales slips, and they would take your radio, or they would take your typewriter, they'd take your whatever. And I would go down there, and I'd get full purchase price, even though I had had it about three, four years, and there were months I'd say, come on, I was freelancing, and, and uh, gee, come on, steal something. I'm having a tough time. With this <laughs> anyway, so here comes Joan. And it's true, we just started hitting it off. We did not want to get involved with working together because we were having too much fun. And the other thing is that we wanted to spoil our romance. So finally, I happened to go to see her. It took a great deal of nerve and courage because, you know, I'd... Uh, fallen in love with a couple of artists and gotten married to them and didn't work out so well. The difference is that Joan was good. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I saw her and I said, oh my gosh, you know, this is the kind of person I've always wanted to find because I had a lot of years in theater myself, so what I'd always wanted to have was a singer who understood the importance of the text and who acts her songs. In fact, right now, she had just finished her new book and we got to ask her about it. Yes, I will but she's gonna sing it for us, or at least the title of it, okay. right? Sure, courtesy of Irving Berlin, 1930. What care I who makes the laws of a nation? Let those who will take care of its rights and wrongs. 
What care I who cares for the world's affairs as long as I can sing its popular songs? Let me sing a funny song with crazy words that roll us long. And if my song can start you laughing, I'm happy, happy. Let me sing a sad refrain of broken hearts that loved in vain. And if my song can make you sad, I'm happy. Let me croon a low-down blues to lift you out of your seats. If my song can reach your shoes and start you tapping your feet, I'm happy. Let me sing of Dixie's charms, the Swanee shore, and mother's arms. And if my song can make you homesick, I'm happy. So as we said, let me sing, and I'm happy, is not only a great Irving Berlin song, but the title of your new book, yep. which is, I guess will be out in a few months? Well, we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Editing, and I have to get pictures to the, yeah. uh, my publisher. So what kind of uh, secrets have you revealed in there? Oh, well. Um, <laughs> um, no, I won't talk about those, but anyway. <laughs> uh, Oh, just stuff, you know, it, it's a common, I'm, what I'm calling it is, um, Let Me Sing and I'm Happy, uh, a mem memoir and handbook of a singing actress. So the first three chapters are all about, you know, how I got to be what I got to be. I came to New York wanting to become an actress. I took the bus from Portland, Oregon in 1965, October. It takes three days and four nights. <laughs> anyway, um, and I had a job waiting. I was a long-distance telephone operator. I got here the month of the blackout. That's when I discovered how nice New Yorkers were. There were guys on street corners with flashlights helping you, you know. Anyway, um, so I talk about early stuff, then I talk about meeting Bill, then I talk about After the Ball, which was the first album that kind of put us on the map. Stuff I'd never <coughs> expected to do, because I'd been in an off-Broadway show called The Drunkard, and we were supposed to, uh, Barry Manilow was music director, and we were supposed to camp up all those things. So I had to get over that attitude before I could record these 1890s songs. But Manilow was the best accompanist before I met Bill, because he knew how to you know, pull back when you didn't need it, and how to be there to support you. Anyway, um, so, oh, and then I talk about what Bill and I have done all these years, as well as performing. We've done a lot of master classes and, um, you know, teaching. And so I talk about how do you find a song that works for you? How do you do a comedy song? How do you, how do you program? How do you uh, find out if a song needs uh, choreography? All that kind of stuff I talk about. Do you find that young people today know anything about Irving Berlin? Do they know the American Songbook? You know, the longer I taught, I couldn't um, depend on, you know, the, the kids knowing some of the composers I talked about. I love to introduce them to Rodgers and Hart and um, Harold Arlen and, uh, and Bill's Cabaret songs. I started coaching those near the end of my teaching. I had a, a course at the University of Michigan called, uh, first it was called Interpretation of American Popular Song, then it was called uh, Cabaret Performance. And, um, you know, oftentimes young people will want to do songs that are too dark for what the audience will accept from them. So I would put joke sequences in between about three or four of the songs because it taught them about timing and listening to the audience. I have a huge collection of joke books. Um, <laughs> you know what you get when you, when you, uh, uh, what do you get when you cross a parrot and a canary? Uh, no. A bird who knows both the music and the words. <laughs> <laughs> Silly stuff like that. Anyway. Well, listen, we are always happy when we can get to hear Joan sing. Ditto for when Bill plays. And that times five for the, our friends in the Garate Brass. Now, since all of us are present and accounted for, we are more or less ready for our grand finale and the world premiere of William Bolcom's Anniversary Rag. Now, a funny thing happened this afternoon because I was listening to the brass tryout and a familiar tune came by. I don't know how many of you listening here in the green space, I know many of those listening at home, were QXR fans in the 1980s. And Bill 
was very much involved with what became the kind of theme song or the theme motif for the station. For quite a number of years, we used these as station breaks. We used these to introduce programs and other things. Bill, what was that all about? Any of you remember that? I guess not. W, WQ, WQXR, which I wish I could say was by me. I tried and tried <laughs> to work out a kind of a tune like that. Our friend Arnold Black, whom you remember also, Bob, was a wonderful guy who, he was sort of almost the unofficial mayor of the Upper West Side musical community <clears throat> and was a, had been a violinist, had grown up as, you know, he had cerebral palsy and a worthered right hand and all kinds of other disadvantages, which he overcame by sheer grit, becoming good enough of a violinist to become the concertmaster of the National Symphony. And he said, now, you know what I'd rather do? I'd like to go back to New York and work out interesting uh, commercials to make them as high line as possible, partly through using the best players in New York. And this is what he did for many years. He won countless Clio's, which are the Grammys or the or the Oscars for the for the uh, commercial community. And they and there were highline things he he did for Sony, he did Mercedes, he did all kinds of things, wonderful things. Uh, I actually was involved with one of them was uh, Estee Lauder, where there was one place where I think it was called White Shoulders, and I played an arpe arpeggio. <laughs> And that arpeggio made me five hundred dollars at the at the at the uh, <laughs> session. And over two years, because of repeats, it made me three thousand dollars. One arpeggio, can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> Which of course was fun. But the main thing was that we all get together with all these really first-rate musicians, all who loved Arnie, because not only because he got them jobs, but also he was a fine musician himself and wrote very good material. And he ran the Mohawk Trail Festival up in uh, one of the first ones that got going in one of those churches uh, up in, in New England. And we, Joan and I, have appeared at it, well, we did actually 40 years of it. And uh, we loved watching the audience getting older and you know, <laughs> children getting married. And then we were long enough to see those children have children. And it was kind of fun to doing that too. But uh, so anyway, but Arnie, I finally had to turn him. I said, I, they asked me to do a tune. I can't. I don't know how to do that. And he says, I got it all quick. So we sat down and, and I watched him. He went, W-W-Q-W-Q-S-R. Now, it turns out, uh, Bob had asked Robert Schubert over here at the top of our, uh, you know, on our stage, said, I want you to do a little piece for uh, maybe a rag for uh, QXR's uh, 40th anniversary of the Young Artists uh, Showcase. And uh, for the trio, which is a little tune you do uh, in the middle of the rag, uh, and that is, as you can hear, you'll finally hear it toward the end of the show, and uh, is played by the French horn in the bass quintet. So that's our little secret here, our, our little private joke. Uh, it is no joke, however, that the Gardete brass isn't on stage. So uh, <coughs> can somebody rouse them out from the bar and, and uh, <laughs> let's... And then we will, Joan and I will sort of set the stage with Bill at the piano, but the actual premiere will be over Jan there. <laughs> All right, are we ready? Is everybody ready? Bill, let's go. Well, are we doing this a little, uh, little uh, colloquy? Sure. You and, and yeah, John? of course. Start with? Yeah, just give us a little okay. fanfare to get it started. 
The stars will awaken, said the poet Percy Shelley, whilst the dews of your melody scatter delight. Sing again with a dream of some world far from ours, where music and moonlight and feeling are one. Forty plus years later, Edward Bellamy left out the moonlight, but expanded on a would-be world of music and feeling. If we could devise an arrangement for providing everybody with music in their homes, he said, perfect in quality, unlimited in quantity, suited to every mood, beginning and ceasing at will, we should have considered the limit of human felicity already attained. <laughs> It took another 40 plus years for that utopian dream to become reality. But that it did with the birth of WQXR in 1936, followed by the rapidly rising star of classical music radio. Temperamental oriental gentlemen are we. Misha, Yasha, Tasha, Sasha, fiddle dee, fiddle dee dee. We're not highbrows, we're not lowbrows, anyone can see. You don't have to have a chart to see where he browse from the start. Just Misha, Yasha, Tasha, Sasha, fiddle dee, fiddle dee dee. score, and two years later, as Lincoln might have said if I remembered to invite him, Harold W. McGraw, Jr. brought forth upon this station the new program, conceived in imagination and dedicated to the proposition that all young artists need help building their careers. It was in January of 1978 that my friend Bob here hosted the Young Artist Showcase on WQXR, and not a week has gone by since then without its ongoing parade of remarkable talents. Yes, I am proud to say that Bella Christova, Nadia Selena Sonnenberg, Joshua Bell, and Yuja Wang are among the many now world-famous artists who made their QXR debuts right here on the Showcase. <laughs> Temperamental, sentimental fiddlers are we. Bella, Nadia, Joshua, Yuja, fiddle dee, fiddle dee dee. Shakespeare says what's in a name, with him we disagree. Names like Sammy, Max, or Mo never bring the heavy dough. Just Bella, Nadia, Joshua, Yuja, fiddle dee, fiddle dee dee. And as Christopher Robin might have said had he waited a little longer, now we are 40. Robert Benchley said that you know when you've hit 40 when there's a trembling of the kidneys to whatever tune the piano is playing. Bob Hope said it's when candles cost more than the cake. But Helen Hayes really nailed it. Age is not important, she said, unless you're in cheese. <laughs> well, I have been called a ham, but... Uh, being around all these wonderful players does keep me feeling young, so I guess I'll hang in there a little while longer. Meanwhile, I had the brass to ask William Bolcom to write us a brand new birthday piece. So Joan Morris lets you and I and Bill eventually sit back and relax while the Gotta Take Quintet lifts our spirits with the world premiere of Bill's brand new anniversary rag. Thank you. 
the best birthday present I could possibly have imagined. The Gaudete Brass Quintet playing the world premiere of William Bolcom's Anniversary Rag. Written for and introduced tonight, one day before the 40th anniversary of the McGraw family's Young Artist Showcase. So great thanks to these terrific Gaudete players, Bill Backstresser, Charles Russell Roberts, Philip Cassell, Paul Van Hoff, and Scott Teggy. Now, Joan Morris, Bill Bolcom, at the risk of being very greedy, you suppose you could give us an encore before we all go home? <laughs> No extra charge. <laughs> this is by Johnny Mercer and Salvatore Guaragna, better known as Harry Warren. <laughs> I don't care what the weatherman says when the weatherman says it's raining. You'll never hear me complaining. I'm certain the sun will shine. I don't care how the weather rain points when the weather rain points to gloomy. It's got to be sunny to me when your eyes look into mine. Jeepers, creepers, where'd you get those peepers? Jeepers, creepers, where'd you get those eyes? Gosh, I'll get up. How'd they get so lit up? Gosh, I'll get up. How'd they get that size? Golly gee, when you turn those heaters on, woe is me. Got to put my cheaters on. Jeepers, creepers, where'd you get those peepers? Oh, those weepers. Where they have no ties. Where'd you get those eyes? Where'd you get those eyes? Yeah. <laughs> so Jeepers Creepers indeed. With Joan Morris singing William Bolcom at the piano, it is time to wind up this jubilant 40th anniversary party for the McGraw family's Young Artist Showcase. The enthusiasm of Terry McGraw has kept our spirits uplifted through all of these many years, and the program series is generously underwritten by the Harold W. McGraw Jr. Family Foundation. Eileen Gabriel, consultant to Foundation, has also been with us today, as were our distinguished composers three. Along with William Bocum just now, we earlier met and heard music by John Corleano, his gazebo dances, first time for brass, and Eric Iwazen, who wrote the fanfare that pops up every week as our showcase opening theme. Chase Copen was the chief engineer tonight. Our WQXR production team included Martha Bonta, Aaron Dalton, and Marin Lazian. And from the green space, my appreciation extends to you all. As Bob Hope used to say and sing, thanks for the memory. And so we'll head on into our 41st year on the Young Artist Showcase. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Thank you.